Welcome back to Between Bells. The historic launch of SpaceX's Crew Dragon Demo 2, which took off on May 30th, is scheduled to make its way back to Earth, landing in the Atlantic Ocean on August 2nd. Marking the conclusion of the NASA and SpaceX mission, as well as the first time SpaceX has flown astronauts. Joining us now is SpaceX consultant and former NASA astronaut Garrett Reisman. Garrett, great to have you with me today. An exciting weekend ahead. Why is this launch so crucial to NASA and SpaceX's ambitions? Well, it's really very important, Nora, and it's because it represents the very first time in over nine years that we've been able to launch our astronauts on our vehicles. I mean, uh, ever since with the last flight of the space shuttle, we've been sending up our astronauts to the space station using Russian Soyuz rockets. And now, uh, if all goes well, we'll have capability once again in the United States to provide our own transportation for our astronauts up to the space station. And that's really just the first step. The next thing is that the NASA doesn't own the Dragon uh, spacecraft or the Falcon 9 rocket. SpaceX does. And what that means is, is that we can then use the same vehicle to fly private citizens up into space, too. So it's really also the start of a whole new era of space tourism. And we were all celebrating the launch back in May, but you've said before, and I love this quote, from the laws of physics standpoint, we're only halfway done. So explain what are some of the challenges in getting back onto Earth? Yeah, you know, we might only be a few days away from wrapping up this 60 day mission. Um, but uh, the truth is that, in my opinion, we're only about halfway done from an engineering standpoint, because all the energy we put into the Dragon to get it up into space, the rocket, all that rocket fuel that we turn into velocity, every drop of that energy has to come back out. And we have to slow them down and safely bring them to a rest in the, in the ocean. Uh, so that is just as difficult as the first half of going up. Uh, the coming home is, is, is difficult. And there are a lot of things in there that we'll be doing uh, for the first or second time. And for that reason, um, yeah, I'm going to be a little anxious <laughs> until I see uh, Bob and Doug uh, on, on the boat with, with smiles on their faces. Yeah, and we saw astronauts Bob and Doug and also their fellow NASA astronaut Chris Cassidy. They held a press conference earlier today from the ISS. Um, you know, I think there was a lot of conversation about the weather and the different variables and trying to get back to Earth. If I understand correctly, once they leave the ISS, there is no turning back. So what kind of flexibility is there as far as the weather, where exactly they can land in the ocean and when? Yeah, that's true. Once they separate the Dragon from the ISS, they're coming home somewhere. <laughs> and Dragon can splash down in any body of water in, in, in around the globe if it had to. But we really want to bring them down very close to our, our recovery boat so they can, within a half an hour or so, get them out of the capsule and onto the boat and, and get them uh, a medical evaluation and quickly bring them back to, to solid ground. I can tell you, after being up in space for three months, even when I landed in the space shuttle, uh, my gyros were tumbling. <laughs> and it, uh, it was tough just to sit up, let alone stand up and walk. So uh, if I'm sitting in a, in, a, in a capsule bombing up and down in the wave, <laughs> I want to get out of there quickly and back to dry land. And that's the plan. But if we had to, they could land somewhere else. And um, uh, they, they have to go somewhere once they, once they leave the space station. Since you brought it up, what is that reorientation process like once you've spent many days in space? What does it feel like to actually land back on Earth? Well, um, is kind of, I guess the best analogy would be someone who is really inebriated. <laughs> but like without all the fun part that goes along with that, I guess. It, it's just you're, 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 it's hard to walk a straight line. Your, your sense of balance is all messed up. And it's because your brain, when you went up to space, figured out that your, your balance organs in your inner ear are no longer working. Hmm. And so it started to ignore those things and just rely on, on your, your sense of sight to give you a sense of up and down and if you're spinning or not. Uh, and then when you come home, though, you need those things again to walk, to stand up, and your brain has gotten used to not using them. And um, so that's that's a tricky process. It takes anywhere from a couple of days to a whole month for that to get back to normal. Wow, that is fascinating. And Garrett, we did see uh, Virgin Galactic debut its design of its cabins for a spaceship, too. You mentioned that this SpaceX NASA mission is the next step in commercial flight for tourists up in space. What is your best guess as to how soon that will be possible at a relatively affordable price point that's not hundreds of thousands of dollars per ticket? Yeah, okay. So it, it, is, quite, it is very expensive. Um, when I say, you know, we have this golden age coming up where anybody can go into space, I really mean anybody with deep pockets. Um, it's going to be in the tens of millions of dollars range for people to buy a ticket on Dragon 
or other spacecraft that can go around the Earth. Um, if you want to go straight up and come straight down, that's what Virgin Galactic is doing. That's what Blue Origin is doing with the new uh, Shepard vehicle. And that's going to be in the hundreds of thousands of uh, dollars kind of price point. Now, eventually, all that's going to come down. And keep in mind, when the airline started, the only people that flew on these initial airline flights from, say, like Burbank to Las Vegas in these rickety old airplanes <laughs> were millionaires and movie stars. And they would dress up in black tie for the event, right? And now today we have Southwest and, uh, <laughs> and JetBlue and, you know, everybody goes, right? So... Um, Anyway, I think we'll follow the same trajectory in space. It just is going to take a while. If I went to space, I think I would also wear black tie attire. That is good to know. But very quickly, you know, we've talked about and heard from Elon Musk of SpaceX saying that we will be colonizing Mars in our lifetimes. That is one of the goals. We're running out of energy here on Earth. Do you think we will be colonizing? Have people actually living on Mars in our lifetimes? I hope so. I don't know if we'll have a self-sustaining colony on Mars. Like if the rockets from Earth stop coming, that they'll be okay. They have everything they need. I think that is still generations away, if not at least one generation away. Uh, but I think we'll be on a, a, a trajectory towards that. I think we'll see the beginnings of that and at least have a toehold or a little colony up there in our lifetime. I think that's certainly possible from an engineering and science perspective. Uh, whether it's possible from a revenue and government funding and political perspective is a completely different question. And I'm not really qualified to answer that question. All right, Gary, thank you so much for your time today and your insight. That's SpaceX consultant and former NASA astronaut, Garrett Reisman. Thanks again.